If you enjoy this content, please like and comment to feed the algorithm god. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron on Patreon. Midna. She was so abrasive, so difficult. When Zant had them in his grasps, it wasn't the sacred beast that he targeted. It was her. She's everything that he isn't. As the rightful ruler of the Twilight Realm, she possesses power that he could never have. This was a cruel punishment for refusing to cooperate with him, and soon, Medna will die. Their only hope came from the light spirit Leneru, who told them to seek out Zelda once again, and the clock is ticking, hero. Telma herself had told Link back in Kakariko Village that her bar had a secret passage into the castle. In his current form, Link will be feared and shunned by any humans he comes across. Understandably so, he looks like a wild animal. Under the cover of night, he sneaks into the city with a sickly and weak Midna on his back. Outside of Telma's bar, a cat catches his attention. It's a bar cat named Louise, and it recognizes Link, so it wants to help. Louise guides Link above the bar and to the old waterway that will get him back into Hyrule Castle. It's clearly been years and years since anyone came this way. The path is in a poorly state and it's covered in large spiders and rats, but it's their best way back into the castle. It turns out to be a very long trek, and with Midna in this desperately injured state, every minute counts. Link has to fight his way up the complex with Midna on his back, adding to the difficulty of it. He gets her to the top of the tower as fast as possible, back to the makeshift prison of Princess Zelda, but the princess, she isn't here. Yet she appears behind them after a few moments. Minna asks the princess to, instead, heal Link of his curse, untrap him from this form, because he's the one that their worlds need. Zelda, the aspect of wisdom, is able to feel the power that did this to Link, and it's different now. It's something truly evil, and while she cannot undo this terrible magic, everything comes with balance. She tells them to go to the sacred grove deep within the Farren Woods to find the sacred blade known as the Master Sword, an ancient weapon that evil cannot touch. It will cleave the darkness shrouding him and return him to his true form. As for Midna, her time is running out quickly. She cannot survive in this state. She cannot survive in the light. The dying princess asks Link if he can make it to the woods on his own. Can he find his own way now? And she asks Zelda to tell him where to find the Mirror of Twilight, the bridge between their worlds. Zelda had suspicions about Midna, who and what she really was. But Midna revealing that she knew of the Mirror of Twilight confirmed to Zelda the truth of Midna's identity. And Zelda knows exactly how important Midna will be in the journey to come. Midna's grace and humility is a comfort to Zelda, who sees the deed of her ancestors as the cause of all this trouble. So, she will not allow Midna to die here. Instead, Zelda casts her power and soul into Midna, healing her of all harm done and strengthening her for what's ahead. Zelda is gone. No trace of her left behind, which begs the question, where is Zelda's body? When the two flee Hyrule Castle, a wall of twilight envelops it behind them, but this is one that Midna could never hope to make it through on her own. There will be no returning to the castle until their journey is complete off to Farron Woods with them to search out the Sacred Grove and the Master Sword. The way back is familiar and quick for the duo. They've walked this path a few times already. Before the Forest Temple, they find that same monkey again, the one that that kid Tallow thought was evil, and that later helped Link through the Forest Temple. In his wolf form, Link is able to talk to her now, and after saving her from a few baddies, she tells Link about a lovely wooded area on the other side of the cliff, a whole different section of the forest to explore. Together they vault across, they conquer a simple series of obstacles, they meet an ill-behaved skull kid that needs a serious boop on his snoot for being so mean and destructive, and then they find a soul-draining puzzle that somehow proves Link's worth to gain entrance to the place that they seek, the Sacred Grove. Nestled peacefully away, it rests, the Master Sword. A blade wielded before to defy evil, now it falls to this hero. Drawing close, it stirs the sword, as though the blade itself were alive. Light cascades all around him and then within. The chosen hero has found his blade, and it will wash away all the darkness of Twilight's curse within him. Finally returned to his true form, never having to fear losing himself again, Link now holds the blade of evil's bane. The shadow crystal expelled from his body can be used by Midna, should he ever need to return to his form as the Divine Beast. She can use this object to make it so. 
With Midna's impending doom and Link's predicament being a wolf both being solved problems, now they can start to scheme ways to handle Zant. And Midna is finally comfortable enough to buddy-buddy up to Link and ask for some jolly cooperation. She even asks nicely. She asks him if they can go track down that Mirror of Twilight together. It's somewhere in Hyrule, but she's not entirely sure where and she could use his help. No, that's a tough one. Link knows almost nothing about this mirror, but he did make the acquaintance of a woman that leads a group dedicated to such studies, Telma, back at Hyrule City. She did invite Link to drop by and join them, so why not take her up on the offer and see what they know about the mirror? The city is absolutely bustling when they arrive. The streets are filled with people, more people than Link has ever been around before. He sticks out like a sore thumb, but people really don't pay him any mind. He's free to run to Telma's bar, pay the group a visit, and inside, Telma gives him a hearty welcome and tells him to go make the acquaintance of his new cohorts in the back of the bar. He meets Shad, a book-smart seeker of knowledge who's always eager to tell a tale, Ashe, an explorer and the daughter of a battle-hardened knight who passed off his combat skills to her, and, well, that kind of looks like Russell, doesn't it? He doesn't say anything, but gives Link a coy little smile when he runs up to introduce himself. None of them have any knowledge of this mirror, though they are missing a member who's at Lake Hylia, studying the far-off desert, a man named Aru. He would be a great lead, he's a man who knows things about the world. They track this Aru character down, high atop a lookout tower at the lake. Just like Telma said, he's studying the desert. He assumes that Link has come to inquire about the weird events taking place there, but well, Link has no idea what this older man is talking about. Aru knows that the Gerudo Desert holds a prison that once housed the worst criminals of the land, and that a mirror exists there that banished them from this realm, though he calls their destination the Underworld rather than the Twilight Realm. That place is one of curses and malice. Its history is cruel and it's violent, but Link must go there. He must investigate this prison and this mirror. Aru guides him to a man named Fire nearby, who runs the Cannon Ride, he gives Link a note to give to Fire. It will secure passage to the desert, albeit through very unusual means. But if it works, well, it works. You can't be choosy here. Fire and Aru have a history. Aru saved Fire's life once, and now Fire will honor any request that Aru sends to him, even this. So he changes the settings on his cannon, loads Link in, and aims for the Gerudo Desert. Thankfully, he's got really good aim with that thing. He shoots Link straight towards the desert where he safely lands atop a mound of sand, surprisingly unharmed. One of Link's hidden talents must be the ability to bounce. Before they begin their trek, Midna discloses some of her people's history to Link and how the Mirror of Twilight connects them. Her ancestors were the interlopers that were banished from Hyrule through that mirror as a punishment for their terrible deeds and desires. Though it's, it's not some underworld on the other side, the Twilight Realm is the antithesis of Hyrule and Midna is part of it. By all rights, they should be enemies, but her people did not become violent, malicious beings. They're quite gentle in the twilight. It wasn't until Zant's lust for power began that things really went so terribly wrong. She doesn't know where he got this great power that he now wields, but it's clearly not the power of her tribe. She cannot return home without that mirror, and since Zant resides within the twilight realm still, they have to find it to reach him. Now Link understands a bit more about his friend and the importance of what they're pursuing. The Gerudo Desert isn't devoid of life. There are wild things here that are hostile towards him and a tribe of Boblin that attack on sight. They've set up camps and blockades in front of that prison Aru mentioned, but destroying their encampments isn't really difficult, just time consuming. When Link and Minna approach the prison, night has fallen. But within, there are still some light sources burning away. This place is falling apart, it's abandoned and in complete disrepair, completely out of compliance with health and safety laws. The paths are locked down, so the last one's out, meant to keep people from getting into this place. And the wildlife that now roams it assists in that. But wild things aren't the only things that roam these halls. The undead will rise out of the darkness to swarm them, and vengeful spirits creep about in the shadows, searching out opportunities to attack the living that enter this forbidden place. Some even use terror as a battle tactic, freezing Link in absolute horror with their shrill screams. There are odd alcoves and tracks around parts of the prison, properly called the Arbiter's Grounds. It's not until they're deep into the dungeon that they find what they're actually used for. Just past the Nipple Chicken, after defeating a terrible enraged foe wielding a massive sword, Link comes to possess a special item called the Spinner. 
and it will act as a transport method, something that Link can use to get up those tracks he's been seeing around the grounds, as well as getting across moving sand pits that would otherwise pull him under. And it also acts as a special key. The old keepers of the Arbiter's grounds used the spinner to seal closed areas of the prison, locks that could not be picked. It's a vital piece of equipment in solving this place. Beyond a massive, once-locked door, they find a sprawling spiral room. The bones of a great beast rest in the middle, and Zant appears atop them. That Link lives is quite surprising to him, but he's not here to monologue. Zant restores life to the bones of the great beast, creating the Stall Lord. If Link tries to approach on foot, the flowing sand will swallow him up. The tracks around the area allow him to dodge the Star Lord's attacks and gain momentum so that he can push himself into the center of the room to attack the spine of the fossil beast. But as the fight carries on, the beast shows itself to be quite intelligent. It puts up obstacles at Link's approach and reanimates the bones of the dead to act as its protectors. It takes several hits to the spine to stop the creature, and for a few minutes, the room goes quiet. The skull doesn't move, though there's a strange energy about the room. Solid ground is revealed, with a spinner key slot that Link can use to raise the pillar that he's on. The top of the Arbiter's grounds is close now, but that suspicion of something being amiss is proven correct. The Star Lord isn't done with Link, and it doesn't need the rest of its body to tear him apart. A new phase begins against it. Starting at the bottom of the massive pillar, Link must ride the tracks back up. Not to the top, but to where the Star Lord patrols about. He's not leaving this thing alive. It's a delicate and awkward balance of speed and aim, requiring Link to travel around the pillar and the outside to catch up with the Star Lord. Then he has to dodge its attacks, maintain that speed to catch up, and time one perfect jump that will let him land a hit. It will stun the Star Lord long enough for Link to reach it on the ground and land a few more direct hits with the Master Sword. This is a cycle that must repeat several times, and each time it gets a bit more difficult to reach it. More attacks, more obstacles, he has to get higher. Around and around they both go throughout the night until finally, the Star Lord is defeated. Their final obstacle before the top of the Arbiter's grounds is gone. Finally, they can ascend to where that mirror waits. Long, long ago, Ganondorf walked these halls as a prisoner en route to his execution. Then the unthinkable happened. The execution failed. The Water Sage was murdered, and Ganondorf was cast into the Mirror of Twilight as a desperate attempt to stop him. The spinner acts as a key to restore the old execution grounds, and Midna is horrified to discover that the Mirror of Twilight has been broken and the pieces are gone. While Midna laments this terrible turn of events, the sages of old appear to them. They together tell them what has taken place here, the tale of Ganondorf, what happened during his execution. They were afraid of his power. They are afraid of his power, afraid that if it passed on to Zant, a whole new evil will overtake Hyrule. Zant's vile magic has fragmented the mirror, but the only one who could truly destroy the mirror is the one who leads the Twilight, the one who holds part of the fused shadow. Zant couldn't destroy it but he was able to break it apart and scatter the pieces. This is a comfort. It means that there is hope. They just need to find all the pieces of the mirror and bring them back here. There are three that they must find. One in the snowy mountains, one in an ancient grove, and one in the heavens. It's all the sages can offer before they vanish into the night. Well, you know, a couple of those will be pretty easy to find, but what they're supposed to do when they get there is a bit unclear. Their best bet is to stop by Telma's bar again and see if anyone can give them a lead. When they arrive, Ashe is gone. Instead, Aru is in her spot. Telma advises Link to go find her. She just so happens to be in the mountains right now, investigating something. If anyone had a lead as to where this mirror piece could be, it would be her. Much of the journey has become retracing old steps, going back to places already traveled to search out new leads. Link and Midna traverse towards the Zora's domain, because there was a snow-covered path that led into the mountains there, and sure enough, Ashe is on that path, dressed in an odd garb resembling a yeti beast. The Zora's recently told her a strange story. A solitary beast on the mountain had been trekking down into the Zora's domain to steal red fish. It looked just like the costume that she put together, but much, much larger. Now, while Link can't track the creature prints in the snowstorm, he could probably track it via scent as a wolf. And that it was stealing red fish from the village gives Link a smell that he needs to learn to do just that. But there's a problem. That particular fish is rare and difficult to catch. It requires a certain type of coral to use as bait. 
and the only one that ever managed to catch them was Prince Rallus. It's been long enough that when Link and Minna roll by Kakariko Village to speak with the young prince, he's fully recovered and is found beside his father's gravesite. The two finally make each other's acquaintance, and the prince seems to be in good spirits. He knows his mother has passed, but he seems to be at peace here. He tells Link that he wants to help him with anything that he might need assistance with. When Link mentions the mountain creature and needing to catch a redfish, the prince happily gives him his coral lure. This should make it possible for Link to catch one of them, and it works. Once he has the scent of the redfish, Link is able to follow the odor all the way up the mountain. It is a really, really stinky rank fish, positively disgusting. It takes him high into the mountains, past crazed creatures and twilight beasts. At the top of a hill is that large yeti creature, but it's quite friendly. It even bids him a hello and curiously asks just what the heck Link is doing all the way up here. Regardless of his reasonings, the creature named Yeto invites Link to his house. He'll make him a hot meal, at least. It's a long ways down, so he shows Link how to slide down the mountain in style. It's a bit of a tough course, but it's kind of fun, too. And at the bottom of the slope is a weirdly creepy mansion sitting precariously on the edge of a drop-off. And inside, the place is absolutely falling apart. What was the original purpose of this place, and why is it so decrepit now? And there are gushing and Poe's here, too. In one of the intact rooms, a smaller yeti creature sits in front of a roaring fire. She's the wife of Yeto. Her name is Yetta. And she asks Link if he came here to see her mirror. Bingo! Exactly what they were looking for. Yeto found the mirror piece on the mountain and gave it to his beloved wife as a gift. But once the mirror arrived, she started to get sick. And monsters began to appear. Bad things just kept happening. So they locked it in their bedroom on the third floor. Yetta gives Link a map of the house and directions on where she thinks the key to their bedroom is, but because she's so sick with a fever, she keeps telling Link the wrong place, sending him all around the broken down manor on a wild goose chase. He finds a pretty neat weapon along the way, a ball and chain to beat down big foes and destroy walls in the way. After several ventures out, Link finally finds the key. The master bedroom is nearby, a quick run to it. Outside, the Yeti lady meets Link, insisting on showing him up to see the mirror. Once inside, Yetta begins to gaze into the mirror, admiring it as pretty, pretty. And she keeps gazing into it, until darkness swarms about and her head twitches around and her eyes change. This is what the Mirror of Twilight will do to those who cannot withstand its power. Yetta is encapsulated by ice and begins to spin around the room. The only way to break through the ice surrounding her is to hit it with the ball and chain when she's close enough. The first ice shell breaks after a few hits, but rather than try and face Link head on, Yetta takes on another form. Encased in ice, she tries to crush Link repeatedly with additions to her icy armor. She rebuilds the armor as much as she can, becomes more aggressive as the fight continues on, but eventually it's too much and Yetta is beaten back. The ice around her falling away. Yetta herself is left unconscious on the floor. They take the piece of Twilight Mirror away, saving this place from its terrible, terrible power. Yetta will be okay in time, and Yetta rushes to his wife's side once he's able to get in. Yetta is clearly not well and in need of care, so he promises that she was just having a bad dream and that he will take care of her. That's good, because Link and Midna need to get a move on again. Also, ew. The sages had said that a piece of the mirror was within an ancient grove. Easy enough, they were someplace similar not too long ago. It's where they got the Master Sword in Farron Woods. They venture back to that familiar place and look around. And who should they come across but that one guy from Talma's bar. The one that didn't speak, but he grinned at Link. He takes off his helmet, and sure enough, it's Russell. He's been part of Talma's group of connections for many, many years. And once upheaval came to Hyrule, he sprang into action. He doesn't know what is across the gorge in the other part of the forest, but he knows that it's not for him. It's a journey that Link needs to take. But he'll offer him aid in getting across. A golden cuckoo that will help him glide. Cuckoos are murderous and bloodthirsty beasts, but this one seems okay. No eye gouging takes place, so cool. New friend. After another tedious, mean-spirited game with the Skull Kid, Link gets back to the grove, but he can't seem to find what he's looking for. He didn't miss anything earlier, but there should be something else here. What could they have possibly been overlooking? After almost a whole day of looking deep into the night, in intense frustration, Link goes back to the pedestal that once held the Master Sword, and he puts the sword back. Surprisingly, this causes something to change. A stone sentinel that was once guarding a weird set of old dusty doors moves. 
So that's what he was missing. Whoops, there was probably a hint about that someplace, huh? Anyways, that door leads to another era within the grove, when a temple still stood on these grounds. This is the Temple of Time. Somehow, a piece of the mirror was cast into it. It's a good spot to hide it. Only a few know the legends of this temple, and the only one who could even gain entrance to it was Link himself. Once again, plunging the sword into its pedestal reveals another path, deeper into the temple. Oh, and a nibble chicken. Very motivated one, but focus. It's time to delve into a place of the past. This temple dungeon is beautiful, but dangerous as sin. The main door seems to be locked, but not by key. Those stone statues always come in pairs, and this one is missing its copy. Minda tells him to get it in gear and find the second statue for this door. Okay, princess. The two join forces with Nipple Chicken to fight off the many terrible foes within the Temple of Time. There's an array of odd enemies that Link has never seen before, relics of a time long past. Every room seems to be a series of fights or puzzles they have to face before proceeding. It culminates into a huge one-on-one -on -one fight against a night creature with a brutal swing. He has to slowly chip away at its armor to make his hits actually mean something. But after its defeat, it is revealed that it was guarding something here. The Rod of Dominion. This is just what they need. It will allow Link to control the movement of certain statues within the temple. It's a bit of a task but Link has also found the second statue that he needs for that door. So now he has to slowly drag it back to the beginning, room after room. Every second feels like an eternity, but patience is a virtue. And patience gets that statue back to where it needs to be. Beyond the mystery door is a change of scenery, something that's a bit more prison or tomb-like, and even more traps. Someone really didn't want outsiders poking around in here. And Link is about to discover why. Beyond the last door is a huge dark room, some statues, some spots of light, not a lot going on. But something draws Link's eye up to the ceiling. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Nope. <laughs> oh, it's gross. Oh, it's gross. <laughs> and then he got the piece of the mirror and he got the hell out. Outside of the Temple of Time, something unexpected happens. Nipple Chicken, whose name is actually Uku, asks Link about that Dominion Rod. She's been looking for a way to get back home to her city in the sky, but now the magic in the rod has been depleted and she can't remember the spell to re-energize it. So she'll just keep looking for another way. But a city in the sky is exactly where they need to be for the final piece of the mirror. Minda tells him that they need to get that thing restored. They need to find that city. The only person they can think of that might know a thing or two about ancient artifacts and magics would be Shad, that character from Tama's Bar. The fellow with the glasses that like to tell stories about history. But when they get back there, he's nowhere to be found. Tama advises Link to take a stroll out to Kakariko. This hero is just a real backtracking trailblazer, isn't he? So once again, back to Kakariko Village. There's a meeting taking place in that main building. Renato, Ilya, Agoron, Elder, and Darbus are all here. The Elder is trying to help Ilya with her memory. During their discussions, the girl mentioned something about the Rod of the Heavens. It was a conversation she overheard, but the details of it are, are long gone. Shad himself is under the building, studying a statue in the basement that might be related to the Rod. For now, they ask Link to help in piecing together what happened to Ilya. The first step will be going back to Hyrule City to deliver a request for assistance to Telma. If Midna didn't have a teleport, then this backtracking business would be truly tiresome. But visiting Telma is always a delight, so off they go. Once again, back to Hyrule City and back to Telma's bar. And as she remembers, the first person to interact with Ilya and to bring her here was the doctor. That really unpleasant old man that refused to try and help the Zora boy. Well, he's just a bit up the road. And to get him to talk, Telma gives Link an invoice to deliver to him. He has a tab going at the bar, and if he doesn't want to help, well, then he can pay up. The guy likes to drink too, because this is a big bill. Blackmail in hand, Link trots to his place, and rather than give him the chance to be a disrespectful schmuck, Link promptly displays the invoice. No messing around anymore, old man. So, apparently the good doctor stole something from Ilya. A statue that he was going to pawn because it looked valuable. But he spilled medication on it that reeked, so he put it outside, but then someone stole it. Well, geez. That statue is a part of Ilya's past, so they need to track it down. Link is able to track the scent of the medication because, of course, the doctor didn't actually clean it up. 
and with that, he's able to run about the city as a wolf, terrorizing the citizens. But he does find who took that statue. It was the bar cat, Louise. But she doesn't have it anymore. It was taken by some skeletal dog beasts just outside of the city. Okay, one more step in the errand chain. Probably best to get rid of skeletal dogs near the city anyways, but you would think the guards would handle that, right? But anyways, Link gets the statue back. It's kind of a weird thing for Ilya to have, but if it helps, then that's all that matters. Upon seeing it, Ilya does remember something. This isn't actually her statue figure, it belongs to someone that was imprisoned with her. That other person helped her get free and sent her away with the statue, and she's sure that whoever it was is still in danger and in need of help. The Elder Goron recognizes the symbol on the statue as belonging to the once protectors of the royal family. Throughout the many wars Hyrule experienced, the tribe of protectors dwindled and faded away. Now any that remain live in a forgotten place. Link must seek them out. That is where Ilya was before she was rescued. The Elder points him towards a path on the far side of the Bridge of Elden. A rock slide has long since made it impassable, but that won't be a problem for Darvis. He will go and clear the path for Link. Onwards, to the hidden village and the tribe that history has nigh forgotten. How Darvis managed to get here faster than Link is a bit of a mystery, but when the hero arrives, Darvis is madly at work punching some boulders into submission. When he's through, he warns Link of a powerful monster ahead and its band of minions. There are 20 of them in total, and if Link wishes to save the person that Ilya mentioned, well, he's gonna need to clear them out. This forgotten town is like a piece set from a different world, perhaps a little reminiscent of Kakariko Village, but it feels like it really is out of place. Link slowly clears every building one by one, taking out each of the 20 enemies littered about the derelict settlement. They don't make it easy. Some are quite difficult to locate. It would have been easier if they just rushed him on the street, but here we are, playing hide and seek with swords and arrows. All 20 he eventually kills, and only then does a door open. A tiny little woman steps out. She immediately greets him as the savior, which is red flag number one that you've stepped into cult territory. Her name is Impaz, the final resident here, named after the founder of the village. It fell into decline with time and became infested with beasts. Now only she remains. She knows his name though, and she knows Ilya. She was under Impaz's care for a short time. While the two of them were huddled up hiding from the monsters in the town, Ilya would say that she knew someone named Link would come to save her. Impaz was able to sneak her out, but due to royal decree, Impaz herself couldn't leave the village. So Ilya had to venture into the wilds on her own. After that, Impaz doesn't know what became of the girl, but she gives Link Ilya's charm to return to the girl. This is something Link recognizes. It will certainly help jog Ilya's memory. Impaz will remain here, but it's time to once again return to Kakariko Village. Wasting no time, they beeline back and give Ilya her charm. This does kick up a memory of back home, of that pool that she would bathe Epona in, and now she remembers Link as well. Once she has that thread into her past, it all begins to return to her. It will take some time to recover, but Ilya is now on the mend. She remembers that she'd originally made that charm as a gift to Link before he left on his journey, or, well, she'd made it for him to use for Epona, it's a horse call that plays Epona's favorite song. He can use it to call upon Epona from anywhere in the kingdom and she'll come running. Now, this entire time, Shad has been in the basement studying that statue. Ilya remembers a bit more, but not enough concrete information to be useful as a guide. Renato directs Link to go see Shad to see what they can uncover together. And Shad is surprised to see Link here, but he's not displeased. He actually could use his help. The statue here is one that he recognizes from his father's old manuscripts. There's sky writing on its tummy, and he thinks it says, Awaken us with the word that breaks the seal. But what that means is a mystery. Minda advises Link to go talk to that impaz woman. People keep talking about that rod and the one who yields it, and the royal family needed to talk to the Uka nipple chickens that apparently lived up there, yet no one seems to have the full, complete story. Maybe Impaz will know more about it. So, they take another trip back to go talk to her. And while she can't answer all of his questions, she does have in her possession a skybook meant to be passed down to the messenger of the heavens, the one who yields the dominion rod. Link might not be able to read it and utilize the book himself, but Shad sure as heck can. Okay, now, back across Hyrule to Kakariko Village. Gosh dang, people. 
Shad is able to understand most of the book. This will solve the mystery of that statue and hopefully get them closer to that city in the sky. Because all of this has been to reach the last mirror piece, lest we forget what the whole point of this has been. Within is a word that Shad thinks might create a response within the statue, but after trying it out, well, nothing happens, it didn't work which is fiercely disappointing. There are a number of other statues around Hyrule that he wants to go try it out on, and he marks each one on Link's map for him to visit as well, should he wish. Right as Shad leaves, though, the Dominion Rod springs back to life. That word from the book, it didn't revive the statues, it restored power to the rod. One by one, Link goes to each of the statues that Shad marked on his map. Moving them reveals letter characters. All in all, Link collects six letters from around Hyrule. Once he has them all, he returns to Shad and Kakariko, who was distraught that the word in the book didn't do anything to the other statues. But the letters Link collected combined to create a new word, one that removes a lock over the center of this particular statue. Now, it can be moved, and the pathway to the heavens revealed. And what is this pathway to the heavens? Well, it's a broken cannon in an enclosed area. Huh, okay. Well, the gods work in mysterious ways, right? Snarkiness aside, this isn't too difficult of a situation. They know of where a cannon operator is in Lake Hylia, the same guy that shot them into the Gerudo Desert, and Midna can teleport the contraption there. Shad is extremely understanding when Link asks him to maybe step out, almost with a wink wink in his response. Minda drops the cannon at Lake Hylia, nearby Fire's place, and the eccentric fellow seems pretty excited to see what Link has nearby. He's a bit of a fanatic when it comes to cannons, and offers to help Link get it all fixed up for the cheap price of 300 rupees. It takes him a couple days of hard work, but Fire does it. He gets that old retro cannon up and working, even warns Link to be careful, because it'll shoot him extremely high. Thanks, Fire. You're not so bad. Stay weird, my dude. Time to load up. Link gets in, Nipple Chicken loads up, and the cannon takes a few steps, it aims, and then they're off. This is the home of the Oka, and it's not really the party that you would expect. Since the arrival of the Mirror Piece, things have really fallen apart. Monsters, beasts, the city is breaking down, there's a dragon here, and the Oka have been getting slaughtered. The city in the sky is hard to traverse. There are a few Oka along the path early on, but once Link gets farther into the city, they're all but gone, save a few terrified survivors. Though the city seems small and contained, it's deceptively large. The buildings were designed to be traversable in a vertical manner, meaning Link has to find his way up or down through the buildings as well. It's not like any place in Hyrule, this strange city amongst the heavens. It's difficult to tell now. This was once a thriving city, created from old but advanced technology. Yet for as deep in decline as it is, it still floats. In its prime, this place must have been an absolute spectacle to behold. Deep within the city, under guard by a strange flying lizard with a serious aggression problem, is another tool for Link to add to his arsenal. An additional claw shot. And of course, this can only mean one thing. Spider Link time, sort of. It's cool, but it's not that cool, because if Link breaks through the cross-universe barrier, then the fanfiction will be truly unbearable. Eventually, Link climbs his way to a high-rise building, where from a great distance, he's seen a large creature flying around it. It's that dragon, one infused with twilight, called Argorok. This beast is one of the most unique creatures Link has had to contend with. The Fiend requires of Link that he finds a way up, even higher, just to reach the beast. He has to be patient, wait for Argorok to get into a good spot, then claw shot his way onto its tail. The weight of the hero pulls the dragon down, but if Argorok can't hold both the hero and its clearly bulky armor, then it will shed the ladder to take to grander heights to fight against the Hylian invading its home. There was one piece of its armor that the dragon did not shed on its back between its shoulders. The fight must go even higher now, making the consequences of a fall greater than before. As the creature sprays fire during their confrontation, Link has to spider his way around the creature to grapple onto its back, but he has to be quick as the dragon won't allow him long to claw shot around unchecked. If he's fast enough, he can get onto its back and deliver enough hits to drive it down into the field where a storm rages on, strong enough that Link can lose his balance and his footing if he's not careful. Once Argorok recovers from the plummet, it's back to the sky for the two to repeat the process all over again. When Argorok is defeated and the beast falls to the field one last time, the skies clear, the storms fade away, and a sort of peace returns to the crumbling city.
Link and Midna have finally found and claimed the final piece of the Mirror of Twilight. Their journey is far from over, of course, but they finally get to conclude part of it, assuming at least that there isn't another blockade put in their way. Midna reminds Link of something that the sages said, that only the true leader of the Twilight can destroy the Mirror of Twilight. Zant couldn't destroy it for just that reason, he's not the true leader. The best he could do with all his power was break it, but now they can finally put it back together and track Zant himself down. The two fly back to the mirror chamber atop that dreadful prison in the Gerudo Desert, and the three pieces of the broken mirror respond to the frame and the remaining piece. When the mirror is activated, the chains holding the great stone that bound Ganondorf in place during his failed execution falls, and a way into the Twilight Realm is opened. In her way, Minna offers comforting words about what's ahead. The Realm of Twilight isn't the home of vicious creatures and darkness, at least not before Zant's cruelty began. It's not an unpleasant place, there's a gentle beauty to it, it's not something to be feared. There will be trouble ahead, yes, but her home isn't vile. The five sages step forward and offer Midna apologies for their underestimation of Ganondorf, their failure to carry out his execution, and for casting him into the Twilight Realm. They know the pain they've caused to the Twilight Princess. They know just who Minna is. With that awful hurt no longer hidden, Minna tells Link her story. She views herself so harshly, a ruler who fled from her own people. She couldn't stand against Zant and Ganondorf. When he attacked her, it was swift and cruel. She was filled with indignation and rage, but fleeing the Twilight Realm to seek Link, it broke her heart. She loves her home and her people. She'd do anything to save them. It brought out a sort of viciousness in her, a willingness to do anything she had to do to stop Zant. And when she found Link back in the forest, she saw him purely as a means to an end. But over time, the selflessness of Zelda and the bravery of Link had changed her heart. She no longer sees them as tools or pawns. She's come to care for their well-beings. She wants to defeat Zant not only for her home, but she wishes to free and revive Zelda. Midna wants to fight for both realms. Together, the hero and the princess cast themselves into the Twilight Realm, where Zant resides. The Twilight have truly suffered under Zant's rule. Those most docile and in control of themselves are still partially transformed into beasts. Minna asks if she can hide in Link's shadow here. She's just too ashamed to show her face to those that trusted her. When Zant took over, he hid away the light of this place, objects called Soul. There were two of them, and the absence of the Soul have kept the Twilight in their forms. If they can find and restore the Soul, then her people should be able to turn back to their natural forms. Machinations and servants of Zant roam the inner halls of the Twilight home, acting as combatants to the duo to stop their passage. Doors are locked, pathways are difficult to traverse, and a fog made up of shadow crystals floods certain areas which force Link back into his wolf form. All these things combined make reaching each of the soul extremely difficult. And to make matters worse, when they do reach the first soul, the image of Zant appears and combat against beasts of twilight begin. It's, it's like a security system of sorts. And once that is taken care of, they find that Zant placed a guardian on the soul a hand that pursues them all throughout the building so long as they're carrying the soul. But they have to get each of them back out onto their pedestals in the main gathering yard in front of the Twilight Castle. It's well worth it though. When exposed to the light of the soul, the Twilight return to their proper form. And once both are collected, something quite wonderful happens. The power of the soul enters the Master Sword, imbuing it with the ability to wield its power. The terrible shadowy fog that blocks their way to the castle can now be repelled by the Master Sword. Zant can no longer hide. They must climb the tower to reach the throne room, one final challenge before reaching their goal, but at the end, he waits. Zant is totally unconcerned with their approach. He seems to derive a certain joy in toying with others and playing word games. The theme of this particular exchange is justification. Zant views those within the Light World, people who are widely unaware of the Twilight, as wardens of the Twilight Realm, which he sees as a prison. He wants the Twilight to be conquerors and himself their king. He'll see it done through any means necessary. The ages that his people spent locked away here regressed them. It made them weak, made them docile, but through his power they will rise again and rule over all. But how is this possible? Well, Zant is all too happy to reveal just how he came to possess the power that he does. 
After his rejection as the next leader of the Twilight Realm, he found his path to power through a god and their desires are now the same. With the powers he now holds from this supposed god, he rises to face Link with no hesitation. Zant might be completely unhinged and wildly unpredictable, but it just makes him all the more dangerous as a combatant. He transforms their arena into places that Link has fought great foes before. First up, the Forest Temple in the Farren Woods, where he shoots projectiles and leaps around the water. His movements are weird and unsettling. After enough hits are landed, he changes the rules and the arena. Now, to Death Mountain. He continues to shoot, but he rocks the platform they're on, making it hard for Link to keep his footing. Zant jumps on the edge of it repeatedly, trying to force Link into the magma below. The iron boots keep him safely planted. Link can't rush at Zant when he has them on, but at least he won't be thrown into certain death below. Next, Zant takes Link into the horrors of that deep pit within the Zora's temple, where he once faced Morpheal, and his weirdness escalates. The mechanics that he used against Morpheal apply here as well. Use the claw shot to pull Zant towards him so that he can land direct blows without having to approach whatever it is that's in the middle of the arena. But Zant escalates and modifies his tactics, making it more difficult to track where he's coming from. With patience, Link can find him and deal damage. Then, another change back to the forest temple, where Zant prances and teleports about totems, taking wild shots at Link. He forces the hero to chase him down, wait for him to be preoccupied with his attacks or his prancing, and then hit the totem that Zant is upon to knock him onto the ground. It's a frustrating practice of timing, dodging, and speed, but after the two land their hits, Zant once again changes the rules and the arena. Now to that icy mansion, where Link fought the possessed Yetta to claim a piece of the Twilight Mirror. Zant takes the advantage in this course and grows in size to tower over Link. His strategy is to stomp the hero out, but his poor little toes are quite vulnerable to the crushing weight of Link's ball and chain weapon. It hits so hard that Zant shrinks back down to normal, making him vulnerable to direct sword attacks. After a few rounds, he once again changes the scenery. Their final round will take place just outside of Hyrule Castle. They've both taken a beating, but neither is tiring. Zant is at his most aggressive now, and he's wielding his own blades. He hurricanes about the floor, swinging his limbs as though they were weapons, approaching Link extremely fast. It can be staved off with his shield, but Link has to catch Zant's approach in time to avoid taking damage. But there's no more changes to be made to the arena. Zant has had enough. Link has won this drawn-out fight. The facade of where they appeared to be fighting falls away, and they return to the Twilight Palace throne room. With Zant's fall, the fused shadow are returned to Midna, yet she does not return to her former self with his defeat. Why is Midna still stuck in this form if Zant is no longer holding power? Though he seems to be dying, Zant takes his chance to sink in yet more taunting words towards Midna. The curse on her cannot be broken, for it's not his power alone that keeps her like this. It is his supposed god that keeps her this way, and because of it, she will never be leader of the Twilight. He calls his god Ganon, and promises that Ganon has been reborn. So long as he lives, Zant cannot be truly killed. He will be reborn, remade, so they cannot win. And Midna no longer studies her anger or holds back. Midna herself attacks Zant, impaling him on the throne and ending his reign. At least for now. If what he said is true, then this is just a temporary stop to Zant's madness. The force Midna used against him, it was only a fraction of the fused shadow's power. If they hurry, they can make it back to Hyrule Castle and use the fused shadow to break the twilight barrier around it. Ganondorf is surely within. He's their newfound target. If they can find him, kill him, end this insanity, then the light and twilight realms can be separated completely, Zelda revived, and peace returned to the lands. It's time for the final challenge. Together, Link and Medda march upon Hyrule Castle. The citizens of the city go about their business as usual, paying no mind to Link as he runs to the barrier, keeping the castle. But perhaps they'll pay heed to what comes next. Once within range, Midna pulls from the power of the fused shadow, and they respond immediately to her call. When combined into one, the artifact almost entirely cover Midna's body, and it thrashes her about the area. At first, she can't control the overwhelming strength of it, but after a few moments, 
she returns. Fully in control and able to beat down Ganondorf's barrier, Minna pierces it with a spear of her own making and brings the entire thing down. Quite the display from a new user of the fused shadow. The castle is now open to their approach, and within they find disheveled and monster-infested grounds. The main castle doors are not open to them, of course, so they search the side courtyards, finding them to be infested with Bulblins, and of course, King Bulblin is here. He's lost twice to Link now, but he's not willing to concede that Link is the stronger fighter. He astoundingly, he speaks to Link, telling him that he's come to play. So once more, the two raise arms against one another. The king is amped up for this fight. His hits do massive damage and he can take even more. Link repeatedly stabs at the King Boblin, but it's like giving him a paper cut. The two brawl for what feels like an eternity before Link once again strikes him down, but this time, the king's demeanor changes. He's been in the service of Zant and Ganondorf because they're strong. He follows whoever is stronger than himself, but now he recognizes Link as the strongest of them all. While he won't rush the castle with them, the king gives Link a key that he will need to progress and he leaves him in peace. Finding their way into the castle takes time and searching for a particular key, but once within the castle walls, they find it to be dark and painfully quiet. A wave of enemies greet them within to try and stop them, but at this point they're really just an inconvenience. Dispatching them gets the lights back on, but it's, it's still so eerie and quiet. The two have another climb ahead of them to reach the throne room where surely this Ganondorf awaits them. It's exceedingly challenging. Not only is it hard to navigate their way up through the broken pathways and obtuse puzzles, but Ganondorf has put some of his strongest minions in their path to protect himself. There's very little fodder here. Everything packs a punch. It takes an immense amount of time to find their way up, and every second counts, as Ganondorf grows stronger feeding off of Zant's power. When they finally reach the top, the throne room of Hyrule Castle. Darkness surrounds it all. A foul wind hurries about them as they run to where Ganondorf waits, not knowing what's in store for them. When they're finally able to see the throne room beyond all the darkness, they behold a terrible sight. Zelda's body is hanging above the throne within the symbol of the Triforce, almost like a mockery of it. And below, Ganondorf himself sits, he proudly welcomes them to his castle. Minna has her choice words about the pleasure of making his acquaintance, but Ganondorf treats her with contempt, referring to her people as amusements and pathetic. Their suffering has fed him as he's grown in strength. It's made it possible for him to regain his body. That old execution wound still pulsates on his abdomen, a remnant from his past, but he pays it no mind as though its existence means nothing to him now. He's one of the three chosen by the gods, the holder of the Triforce of Power, and he gladly shows it off. Midna's steadfastness in opposing him is an amusement. He has no fear of the two standing before him. In fact, he welcomes them to try and stop him. He has such a wonderful idea for how to commence this event. He turns his eyes up to the body of Zelda, and he casts himself into beams of twilight. When Minna was bathed in light, it nearly killed her. The pain was consuming, so she tries to stop the twilight from reaching Zelda, but she can't. It passes right through her and immediately infects Zelda. And Minna doesn't have the heart to strike at Zelda's body before it awakens. She doesn't know what's going to happen, but she just can't bring herself to harm her friend. When Zelda's eyes open, it's clearly not her in control. Ganondorf is using her as a puppet, a cruel blasphemy that will take up arms against them. She strikes at Midna, sending her out of the throne room, locking Link inside alone. In merciless wrath, Ganondorf forces Link into combat with the body of Princess Zelda. They commence with a game quite similar to the one Ganondorf played with another hero of the past. Back and forth, they hit orbs of light at one another, each of them taking their fair share of hits. Between matches, Ganon launches Zelda's body towards him in an attempt to throw him off guard. But the focus of this exchange is the back and forth between these orbs. It's so hard to watch this be done. To Zelda, she showed such kindness and care to both Midna and Link. She did her best to save her people. She sacrificed all she had left to save Midna's life. In their most dire hours, it was she that carried them through and now she's not but a horrid nightmare. 
her former self gone, left to be a plaything of the evil king. Link is able to keep the upper hand and stop the attack of Ganondorf's puppet just long enough for Midna to collect herself and call upon the fused shadow. Midna does not harm her friend. Instead, she takes Zelda into her hands and forces the Twilight out of her body. But she still doesn't move. She still doesn't draw a breath. For now, at least, she's relatively safe upon her throne. The Twilight that Midna cast away begins to reform. Ganondorf begins to reform. Though this time he does not return in his Gerudo form, instead, he greets them as Ganon, the Dark Beast. He seems almost invincible. Thrashing around and charging through the arena makes him difficult to make sense of. But with Midna at his side, there are two sets of eyes gauging what the hell is going on here. Ganon is teleporting through and running about the area. But if Link can get distance between himself and Ganon, then he can line up a shot to strike and stun him via the gem on his forehead. Then once he's down, Link will have but a few swift moments to descend upon him and strike at the old execution wound on his belly. The speed and aggression of Ganon makes this a difficult cycle to repeat. The hero takes several hits from the evil king, and as the fight carries on, Ganon becomes more evasive and wily. He uses twilight magic to vanish when Link's strikes come too close. He begins to open up multiple portals to hide where he's coming from. He becomes so elusive that Midna tells Link he needs to change his own strategy, become a beast as well. Midna changes him into the form of the sacred wolf, and she too joins the fray. It's incredibly tough timing, but Link needs to lure Ganon in and she will catch him by the face. Then immediately she can toss him and Link can rush towards that wound to deal damage. This repeats a number of times before together, Link and Minda drive the beast back. They defeat Ganon. With what remains of Ganon burning in a strange yellow flame, the curse Zant put upon Midna begins to fade, just a bit. Midna so desperately wanted to return Zelda's gift, restore her spirit and revive her, and with Ganon defeated and her curse crumbling, she can do just that. Zelda's spirit returns to her body, no longer lifeless and hollow. The Princess of Hyrule is restored to her former self. Midna and Zelda shared the same heart for a brief time. They were as one. And Zelda understands the immense sorrow Midna has suffered. Finally, someone understands her. And though this be a tender moment, this is, of course, not the end of the evil King Ganondorf. He is rising again, and they don't have long before he descends upon them in full force. Midna intervenes. She sends both Link and Zelda away, into the fields of Hyrule, away from what she intends to do. Perhaps she can't stop him, but she can at least harm or weaken him. When her companions are safely away, Menna dons the fused shadow one more time and evokes as much power as she can from it. In this empowered form, Menna violently throws herself at Ganondorf. Far off in the fields of Hyrule, Link and Zelda see the impact that Menna brings upon the vile man. It's so immense that it levels the castle. But to their absolute horror, he's already here. So quickly, before the rubble even settles, Ganondorf finds them. And he holds in his hand Midna's helm. He killed her. The Twilight Princess has fallen. Now only they remain to contest him. Ganondorf wastes no time monologuing and doesn't hold any punches. He charges upon them with spectral warriors at his side. The two are vulnerable on the ground, and even if they could face him on a level playing field, Ganondorf will just feed off of Zant and Twilight to reform himself over and over again. In a desperate plea to the Guardians of the Lands, Zelda holds back Link's attack and beseeches them for aid, and true to their purpose, they respond. They're taken out of the chaos of the field for a brief moment, taken to a space between realms made safe by the Light Spirits. The four of them gift to Zelda an ancient weapon, light arrows, that can cause truly grievous harm to that which is evil. These will aid them in casting Ganondorf down. And Zelda asks of Link to one last time lend his power to this world, one more fight to save the lands. Her request is done out of respect and regard for the hero. He will of course do this, she needn't even ask. But this time, the aspect of wisdom will ride with courage. 
return to the field atop Epona, both Link and Zelda ready their weapons. A grand chase begins across the plains. Zelda will fire upon Ganon as soon as they're within range, lighting him up with the light arrows. The impact and shock of them stall Ganondorf out long enough that Link can draw in close and deliver sword strikes. They make for a ruthless team against him, and Zelda is quite a shot with that bow. Ganondorf resorts to shooting off orbs towards the ground to frighten Epona and toss Link from his saddle, and it works a few times. This is far from a one-sided fight. Ganondorf himself is eventually dismounted after taking a royal beating from Zelda's arrows and Link's sword. And while he's lost his horse, the evil king is far from defeated. He wields the sword used in his own execution as a weapon. He wishes to use it to blot out the light of this realm forever, and to accomplish this, his first act will be killing Link. The two now face off in one-on-one -on -one combat. No outside interference will be permitted. The dark skies reflect just how dire this exchange is. The two cannot escape each other. It's destiny that they once again take up arms. Ganondorf is an immensely skilled swordsman. They must dance around one another to find openings for attack, though they both often find dead air on the other side of their swings. Link's hit causes harm, but Ganon's cause much more. Link's saving grace now being his speed. He can move around their field faster than Ganondorf. And the battle between them is long. This is the greatest foe Link will ever face, and Ganondorf fights like his life depends on it. After all, he's been waiting lifetimes for this, imprisoned within Twilight. He once swore that he would find the ancestors of the ones who ruined him so long ago, and they're right here before him. His rage has carried him to this, and he's earned this fight. The constant exchange of damage between the two is staggering, and Zelda cannot intervene to tip the scales. After what feels like hours of fighting, Link finally, finally cuts Ganondorf down and pierces that old wound with the Master Sword. He swears that it's not over here, that this is not the end. The history of light and shadow will be written in blood. But life is slowly fading from him, his eyes droop, his wound no longer glows. Through twilight, his bond with Zant, and the weakening power of the Triforce within him, he will eventually be remade. Though, for a moment, we see Zant. Where he is isn't certain if this is a vision isn't known. But Zant snaps his neck to the side, and Ganondorf's eyes become lifeless. Now he is truly dead. Though he doesn't fall, Ganondorf's final breath is taken in that field. The evil king is finally dead. But this is not quite the end. Remember our Twilight Princess. Minna's life must be restored. Both the realms of light and twilight need her. So the four light spirits of Hyrule come together to see this tragedy undone. Ever so gently, they restore her to life. Throughout their travels together, Link and Midna faced almost insurmountable odds time and time again, yet they always made it through together. A fierce friendship forged during the most dire of times. Her return will bring the happiest of endings to this. Though she does not return as Link remembers her, with the curse of Xant and Ganondorf completely dispelled, she walks now in her proper form as a Twilight, the powerful and beautiful ruler of the Twilight Realm. Bit of a shock to see, even Link is taken aback, something that she immediately notices and puts on blast. But now is a time of healing, time for things to be made right. It will take some time, but things will get back to normal. Zelda, Midna, and Link travel back together to the Arbiter's Grounds, back to the Mirror Chamber where the portal to the Twilight Realm resides. It's time for Minna to go home, to take her place as the ruler of her people, to rebuild her kingdom. Light and shadow cannot mix. She cannot stay here, nor would she want to. It's not her home, not her place to be. She's longed to return home to her people for so long, and now she finally can. But that doesn't mean that saying goodbye to her friends isn't difficult. It doesn't mean that doing what is right isn't difficult. So long as the Mirror of Twilight exists, their realms can interact. And Midna knows this is a luxury far too dangerous to be allowed. She sends a single tear toward the mirror, shattering it. The path between these two realms will forever be closed. 
Never again will something like this be allowed to happen. No foul usurpers will ever threaten the other realm again. So farewell, Midna, and thank you for everything. It is now time that we really say goodbye. To the wise princess, the brave hero, the powerful vile king, we depart from the lands of Hyrule, of Termina, of the Twilight Realm. On to other adventures and stories, yet always in our hearts we'll remember the tales of the hero and the worlds his courage saved.